shadowy outlines of the modern-day bicycle were first seen in 1808 in the two-wheeled hobby horse propelled by pushing one's feet along the ground. The velocipede rolled onto the scene 10 years later, but it took 57 more years for the next stage of bicycle evolution to come about. A frame sporting two wheels, an axle, and pedals caught the public's eye at a Paris exposition, and bicycle development was finally on a roll. The late 1880s, the age of the Industrial Revolution, New discoveries in all areas of manufacturing pushed bicycle development into high gear. In 1888, Dunlap developed the pneumatic bicycle tire. And uh, at that time, we, developed, we were developing the, the roller bearing, the ball bearing. And the other great thing that happened then was the invention of the chain. Now, remember, when you had the big high wheel, you had that because the bigger the wheel was, the further distance you could go with one revolution of your feet, but you were limited to what your crotch dimension was, that is, uh, to reach the, the center pedal. When we had the chain, we were able to re eliminate that big high wheel and have it what we call a safety bicycle. That's the bicycles you have today. The two wheels are about the same size. So with the development of those invention, about 1890 begins the big boom in bicycling. Now that we have a safety bicycle, roads were getting better constructed. Everything was fitting into this sort of situ, this sort of an environment in itself. And that's where the bicycle boomed. Suddenly, almost everyone was manufacturing bicycles. One source listed as many as 300 bike makers in the United States and England. Syracuse was a city whose economy was based in manufacturing, so it seemed only natural that some companies here joined this new and profitable industry. I know there was uh, about, oh, maybe seven, eight, maybe a dozen firms that were manufacturing bicycles in Syracuse at that time, and there was probably about as many as 50 dealers at that time, judging by the directories which uh, were published at that time. And uh, the uh, one figure I did, one of the, I did hear is that one of the highest productions was by the E.C. Stern Company, uh, and they say that at their peak, they were making as many as 500 a day. A former hardware and wagon wheel factory, Stearns wheeled its first bicycle off the production line in 1892. Within a few years, its Oneida Street factory covered four acres, and shifts worked day and night to meet demand for this new mode of transportation. Barnes Cycle Works, the Olive Wheel Company, Syracuse Cycle Company, Empire Cycle Company, and Dodge Cycle Company joined Stearns in creating a bicycle manufacturing industry that at one point was worth six million dollars and supported one-eighth of the Syracuse community. More engineering was done in the invention and development of the bicycle than in other, any other major project that we had. So the companies in Syracuse, of course, were trying to sell their product, and they were trying to, of course, always improve it as they proceeded. Uh, and so they, they made a contribution on a small scale. Newspaper articles written at the time were less modest about Syracuse's contribution to the industry. Stearns was the first American maker of lightweight bikes, the first company to use wooden rims, adjustable handlebars, and narrow tread. Barnes introduced a flush joint in the bicycle's frame, for what was reported as neater appearance of the wheel. Colored enamel was also introduced by Syracuse bicycle builders, giving rise to the yellow fellow, the crimson rim, and the white flyer. Bicycles changed the face of the countryside. Roads were improved to accommodate cyclers, new fashions designed for stylish, comfortable riding appeared, and cycling clubs for fun and sport cropped up. As more bicycles crowded into the marketplace, competition among companies became more fierce. Manufacturers spent substantial dollars on advertising, they sponsored cross-country racing teams, and they engineered publicity stunts. The Stern Company, uh, one of their promotions they did is interesting. They made a, one of their employees made a uh, six-tet, I believe you call it a bicycle for six people, mm -hmm. a tandem, a tandem six-tet because they ride behind one another. And they were well geared so that each person riding that would make the equal contribution to the, you know, the driving of the bicycle. 
and they tried to, uh, 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 they did set up a rate, a race you might call it, with the Empire State Train. And they started off over in Getty someplace here, and there was apparently a, f a, a well flat area they could ride on between four lines of tracks that was there. So the train comes in at around 60 miles an hour, and the bicycle riders are supposed to have passed them. The team, pedaling furiously, beat the train. But some companies couldn't beat back the increasing competition. In Syracuse, Stearns and two other firms joined forces. The first few years on that, it was a tremendous industry to get into, it was a great opportunity. So the companies who were in business at that time did extremely well. And then towards the end of the period, the competition became very, very difficult. Everybody was trying to get into the manufacturing of bicycles, and some companies, of course, uh, didn't survive. And then it's interesting to note that to survive, a number of firms in Syracuse uh, formed a merger. At that time, they said they formed a trust, but I think a trust is pretty much like we might call a merger today for survival. But it was a stopgap measure. The automobile encroached on bicycle territory, and the trust went bust. By 1905, Stearns returned to hardware manufacturing, and the country's bicycle building center had moved to Massachusetts and Connecticut. But in Syracuse, it had been fun while it lasted. Rochelle Casella, WCNY, Upstate Chronicle.